Hello, everybody, and welcome back to a brand new episode of the Constlog, your favorite newsletter, not newsletter, podcast about JavaScript, the web, and everything related to those things. I am here with always with my uh, favorite co-host, my, my, my beloved uh, uh, partner in crime, uh, Matthew Gersman. Hello, Matthew. Wow, I, I'm honored by that introduction. I can't even imagine how you introduce your wife. I, as, as my wife. She's my <laughs> wife. That's how I introduce her as. Uh, this is episode number uh, 58, the past week of, uh, where's my numbers, November 29th through December 5th. We are officially in the month of December, which means that we are on month 12 of 12 of 2018. Uh, the year that was so tumultuous is almost at a close. Uh, two show notes to uh, start you off with. Again, I want to plug that we are on Spotify. If you are a happy Spotify user, please do subscribe to us on Spotify as well. If you are listening to us elsewhere and you want to get that in your Spotify queue. And also a note that we are going to stop uploading this podcast to YouTube at the end of the year. 2019 is the year of audio and we will live only in audio form. I got nothing else, Matthew. Do you have anything else to start off the episode with before we get started? Yeah, as many of you know, I am a big theater fan. I just saw the show Network with Brian Cranston, and as part of my experience, I got to touch Brian Cranston, which I am very excited about because I am a big Breaking Bad fan. That's uh, it was a good network request with a post and get. It really was. Anyway, let's let's kick off the music. Starting off this week's episode, we're going to talk about the quite scary vulnerability that was discovered this past week about event stream. If you're not aware about what I'm talking about, uh, the long story long, because it's kind of hard to make short, but I'll do my best, is there was a popular open source NPM package called event stream. Uh, the published rights was given to somebody else on the internet, and effectively this other individual was a bad actor, and through many... Uh, fancy and obfuscated tasks and, and techniques was able to actually include um, some JavaScript code that if you installed it on your machine would steal your Bitcoin wallet and send it to this hacker. So it's a very specific attack, but it's been there since, I think it said since November or was it October was what the blog post said. Yeah, it was about a uh, month. It was a really... You know, th this isn't a good thing, obviously, but it is a very impressive attack. There in, he is. In yeah. the way it was executed. They, uh, they gained commit rights. They actually made some valuable contributions to the library. They actually maintained the library. And then they went ahead and, under another account, created a dependency with this intentional vulnerability and then included that dependency in... Uh, the in the core library and the dependency was like a flat map which everyone was just like well as long as it's not smoosh we don't care and <laughs> <laughs> it ended up causing this this massive vulnerability i mean i feel vulnerable i mean it's also it was also just done cleverly there was like two layers of encrypting the attack so to actually like there was not a simple thing that you could just do a uh, find all search it was actually like encrypting the data and decrypting it uh, there's a blog post in the show notes that goes into great detail about how this was done uh, breaking it down um, it's it's unfortunate that there was such skill involved in this attack like there's some things that was done here that i would have to learn how to do myself if i were even to try to make this attack which makes it all the more scary but that's what happens with popularity. NPM is a huge attack vector because it is so big and this is gonna keep happening and we're gonna to have to keep fighting it as that goes along. But um, it's it's this sad, scary state of the world. Um, but thankfully we're all programmers so then we can actually still figure out how to end it. But Yeah, do we know how many people were compromised, if anyone? I think the NPM blog actually has some numbers on there but I don't really uh, have that in front of me right now, but it was definitely a lot more exposure than the previous tack, which was um, a couple months ago. I forget what it was about, though. But there was another tack that was luckily caught right away because the skill of that hacker was uh, smaller. <laughs> the skill here was much bigger. Yeah, it's that. This is just part of living in the future, right? Like we can all just do our best. Yeah. Yeah, if you're if you're fortunate enough to work at a company that has a security team, here is your PSA to listen to them 
when <laughs> when you say also hey. also uh, run npm audit to see if you have this vulnerability currently in your node modules tree npm audit will tell you right away and get that resolved for you yeah Cool, moving on, we have a brand new blog post from the React core team titled the React 16.x Roadmap. And this was a um, greatly needed blog post because I think there's been a lot of ambiguity and confusion in the React community about all these upcoming features that the React team has been talking about at conferences, uh, having small releases of, and this blog post kind of lays out in great and explicit detail what they what their roadmap is for the next couple, uh, actually for the next year, really. Um, yeah, well, it gets up to mid twenty nineteen is where where the roadmap ends, which is funny because that was my core takeaway from this. It's funny because they're like, you know, this is the time we expect the one with hooks. They actually, uh, I wonder if they intentionally used the Friends episode naming. Yeah, scheme. I'm curious about that as well. Yeah, so React sixteen dot x, which is uh, Q one twenty nineteen, is the one with hooks. React 16x Q2 2019 is the one with concurrent mode, and then mid 2019 is the one with suspense for data fetching. But what actually, uh, the way, my biggest takeaway was, oh, I don't have to worry about any breaking changes in React for at least another seven months. <laughs> That's awesome. But also, there's never going to be a break. Like even if there's going to be a change in, in React 17, in like later, like in a year from now, I think they're still going to have backward support for what you currently written. Like I saw some tweet from Dan Abramov saying that they still support react.create class in Facebook because they don't need to go back to all these legacy components and migrate them to classes. They still support that. So there might be a breaking changes in terms of some, some APIs, but there might also be a compatibility layer as well. Again, this is all speculation. There's no way to know, but. Yeah, uh, and the, the thing though with breaking changes though is uh, some like if a breaking change requires a code mod, then like you're you're talking about a lot of work to fix a massive code base. Like you've got a even if like there even if it's a one line code mod, right? From like like from component will mount to unstable component will mount. Like yeah. you've got to go through potentially tens or hundreds of thousands of lines of code. You've got to like you've got to hope your test suite is good enough. You've got to wait for your users to report some edge case that no one ever thought of ever. And it's things do happen. So it, it's yeah. nice that you, we can just take for granted that until the middle of next year, there will be no breaking changes. Yeah, and the, the roadmap they laid out is uh, they already shipped um, React.Lizzy and Suspense. If you want to learn more about that, I have written actually a blog post and YouTube video about that, self-plug, self-promotion. Go to hswolf.com to read more about React.Lazy. That's already out there. Um, they're talking about having React hooks actually be shipped uh, quarter one, 2019, quarter, uh, the second quarter, quarter of the second, depending upon how you talk. I don't know. Quarter uh, the second. Quarter the second. That, that uh, sounds like a that sounds like a, a punishment for like a list of people in like. It, it, quarter in the list. second quadrant. <laughs> yeah. The pony has been mean. <laughs> uh, uh, they're going to release a concurrent mode, which they teased way more than they probably should have, but I think they were as excited as the community is now as well. And then um, later, twenty nineteen next year, they're going to have. Um, suspense with for data fetching, which is kind of like their built-in way to do data data fetching, data caching. It's kind of, it, I, the easy way to explain it is like having Redux or some version of Redux built into React. That's coming later, twenty nineteen. But yeah, I Re I don't know about you, Harry, but all of this has been giving me a lot of feelings. I mean, we just, oh yeah, the roadmap got me excited, and before that, we were talking about the the event stream thing, and that just made me feel vulnerable. And you know, you know what else some people call feelings? They call yeah, yeah. them they call them emotions. And, uh -huh. and you know, you know how many emotions I think I think I have as many fingers as you have. Yeah, I think I have about ten emotions because <laughs> you have ten fingers. <laughs> yeah, I just can't, just double checked. I have ten. I fingers. just looked. Yeah, I just saw. You're like, are they still there? Have I lost a finger while typing too much? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, the Emotion team announced Emotion 10, which we are all very excited about. And it, uh, Harry, do you want to give the technical explanation? You're losing it right now. Uh, Emotion is a very popular CSS and JS library. It's competition. Not that it's 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 an alternative to uh, styled components. And they just had a big release with Emotion 10. 
the marquee feature of this release is the ability to use, if you use CSS and JS, you know that you can actually do uh, styles via this fancy CSS prop, which essentially lets you write inline styles that actually get compiled down to class names and efficiently at that. And Emotion figure out a very clever way to actually allow you to use this CSS prop without a Babel plugin. Uh, it's kind of a cheat because they actually do it via changing the JSX pragma for the JSX Babel transform. That was a lot of jargon, but pretty much that means that when you write JSX, Babel transforms that down to react.createElement function call. In Emotion 10, what they've done is actually tell you to actually change it to point to the emotions react.createElement function call, which is essentially a wrapper around that with additional emotion specific functionality for the CSS prop. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I I always think these Babel hacks are super cool. Actually, like I love the idea of optimizing our code, but like under the hood at the compile layer, but not changing anything in our actual code base. So I'm okay. I'm always about these things. Cool. Yeah. It, Speaking of the compile layer, <laughs> TypeScript has just announced version two uh, three point two. Sorry, not two point three. Two point three was like a you long time ago. In there. That, that would not be exciting. But anyway, version 3.2 is out now. You can read the blog post that we have linked to below. And it has a bunch of new features, but the one I want to call out that I am most excited about is generic is spreading on generic types. Mm. So now if you have some type of generic object and you want to get like the first two parameters off of it and then collect the rest of them or spread the rest of them, you can do that and it will not error out. And this is really convenient, especially when you're writing like a higher order component or really just like anything that's like very templatized. It's it's a really exciting feature. I've run into so many bugs as a result of this. I had to write a whole doc internally at my job on how to write higher order components in TypeScript, and now most of that is unnecessary. So I'm excited. Harry, is there any flagship feature that you're excited about? No, we're we're slowly trying to get TypeScript in our company, but don't have as much hands-on experience as you. So I will definitely defer to your excitement. Yeah, I I just type in the TypeScript all the time. Speaking of other releases, uh, Babel, everyone's favorite and only transpiler, except for TypeScript and all other transpilers. Uh, Babel. Uh, <laughs> hey, transpiler is not so fast, my friend. Trans that's what I said, transpiler. Did I did I mumble? Maybe. No, uh, I was just I was just quoting uh, a talk from a friend of ours. Oh, fair Jem enough. Young gave a talk called "Transpiler is Not So Fast, My Friend," and I bet you uh, he forgot about that talk until he listens to this episode. Cool. We'll have to plug in for sure. Uh, there was a kind of a milestone merge into Babel this past week where they actually merged in uh, private class method support into Babel itself. Uh, this this is a this is, has been an ES proposal for a while. It's at stage three. It's going to be I think it's already implemented in uh, Chrome actually in Chrome seventy one or something recent like that. But it actually adds syntax to uh, ECMAScript to allow you to actually have uh, private class methods such that you can define methods on your classes that are inaccessible from an external consumer. And this is now merged into Babel itself proper, meaning that it's like real, yo. So if you want to start adding some accessor uh, behavior to your JavaScript that is now going to be in Babel today and in uh, browsers soon. Yeah, I've actually been complaining about this feature as long as it's been around. This is, I, I, I'm a big FP fan, as you may know from my talks, and this is just like, this to me it just feels like it's obfuscating logic. But, you know, I'm glad the world is moving forward. Uh, when speaking of moving forward, let's take a break and reflect on the past. There was a great tweet this past week from uh, Harry Roberts, who's a CSS wizard. He's not, so, he's, he's not the same Harry that's on this podcast. That's Harry Wolf, also known as Harry Wolf, also hungry like the wolf. Uh, Harry Roberts is a uh, whiz when it comes to the CSS, and he actually asked a really interesting question that I was curious about, which was, uh, can any W3 historians tell us why, when you actually want to include an external style sheet on your page, it's link rel style sheet instead of style source equals, like and if you include. I love the response to this so much because the W3C committee actually responded on their official Twitter and they were just like, at the time, it was completely obvious that was how we ha handled all external resources. And then style circ 
or uh, or link uh, script circ was the exception to the rule and then eventually became the rule. So I think it's so funny how like something that today is like this, this almost this piece of tech debt that we're stuck with is what at the time was at the time completely the obvious and right choice. It also just shows you how the whole mental model about how people think about web pages have has been completely inverted since that time. Like when Blink Rel was made, it was the concept of a web page was like this is a document and I'm gonna have related styles for this document. This is just a document. And now we're like, oh, this is a web application. Where is my source for my scripts? And it's a complete just mental model shift, which is just illuminating in some ways just to see how that has changed. Yeah, I mean, it's called the document object model for a reason in that it was a yep. document at, for a long time. And that was just abused way too much. I, I had, in the third grade, a website with animated GIFs that played a MIDI from Ocarina of Time. It was the Gerudo theme. And that website was dope. And I am so upset that I don't still have the source to it. What, what was the host? Uh, Angel Fire. Beautiful. Yeah. Which, which was, do you remember which uh, network, which part? <laughs> uh, it was uh, Angel Fire was eventually owned by Lycos. Um, and uh, hold on. No, because usually they had like subdomains where they would uh, splinter it off into areas. Yeah. So I I, I do know I uh, I don't want to. I will, tell it's okay. you, I will tell you that the first subdomain was DBZ because of Dragon Ball Z. Beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, also, this past week, I saw a really interesting tweet. Um, someone was talking about, I don't even know the context, but they, this, this is out of context, but it's self-contextual. Any case, sure. somebody, was, <laughs> somebody, somebody had a tweet from this quote about how there's this concept on nuclear-powered subs called brass bar debugging. And what that means is uh, when you're in the control room for in the power plant in a nuclear-powered sub, there's actually a brass bar in front of the control panel, such that when alarms begin to go off, that means things are going wrong, and you're uh, hundreds of feet underneath the water, freaking out a little bit, the, what engineers are trained to do is grab that brass bar with both hands and hold on until they looked at all dials and indicators and figured out what's happening. And this, and then the reason why they do this is because it reduces the temptation to want to just start flipping valves and toggling things before you actually understand the problem at hand. Because if you start reacting without thinking, you're actually gonna make more problems for yourself from the beginning. Um, which I thought was just a beautiful little like person hack. I, if you've ever been in uh, Japan or in actually the Manhattan subway system, which actually stole this idea from Japan, when a subway pulls into a stop in Manhattan and you're sitting, you're standing where the uh, conductor for the train is, which is in the middle of the train, you actually see them point to this black and white checkered panel on the side of the subway station. And that's this human behavior that says, hey, I pulled in fully to the subway station and I'm pointing to verify that I've done that. And that's this, this hack that someone that was running the MTA took from Japan because they saw the same thing there, that having this physical gesture actually helped orient the mental behavior as well. And that's the same thing here with brass bar to button, which I thought was just, just a wonderful just like mental hack that has so many like, like imagined applications to engineering debugging as well. Yeah, I, I thought this was brilliant. And then you gave the MTA credit for something, and they just do not have it together. So. <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, so what this problem that they solved with this was actually, for a long time, uh, subways in, the, in, in Manhattan wouldn't pull into the subway platform the entire way. <laughs> so people couldn't get off. And that was an issue for a long time until they figured out this solution. And what did they so, finally figure that out five years ago? Uh -huh. <laughs> for those of you who don't I mean, live in New York, the MTA is a constant source of frustration for those of us who do. But like, I mean, it, it kind of shows that sometimes the simplest of tricks can ha can have the most profound of impact. You know like that, I, is it an urban legend or an actual story about the pen in space? Which one's that? Uh, where NASA spent like millions of dollars trying to develop a pen that would work in space and they did this and then at some point someone realized that you could just use a pencil. <laughs> I don't Sounds know if that's a much. true story or an urban legend. You know what? Tweet us and tell us if it is. Please do. Um, cool. Cool. So next up is a cool new, like, early, early draft proposal for the browser 
which allows for a notion of writable files in the browser. So this is really kind of cool. And historically, if you want to do any type of file writing in the browser, it opens up a dialog box, which has a, which makes you choose where to save it. And that's a save as thing. And, or the other option, like, which is the complete opposite is you could use like local storage, which I think might have a maximum on size, but, and, and there are other ways you could use like a SQL database locally, but there hasn't been any notion of like, Hey, I want to access the user's file system and just save data in a place that they recognize. And this is a really cool proposal that is, it, it's the editor's draft as of November 26th. So this thing is crazy early, but I'm really excited to see what happens to it. I I mean, it's adding more APIs to the browser to let it be a more viable first-party application target. Uh, most applications require access to the file system, and the fact that you can't in a browser really hamstrings what you can actually make. And having this uh, is going to be sweet. Yeah, I, I also look forward to all of the security holes that come up as a result of this. <laughs> oh yeah, when that NPM module gets uh, vulnerable and all of a sudden someone's RMRF'd your um, entire hard drive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, I, any application can do it if you give them super user access. And you know, a way that potentially the JavaScript community could prevent this is by having maybe some type safety in JavaScript. And that leads us to oh, our. Oh, you know. That was good. I, I wanted to give it to you, but like that is such what a stretch. Mean? What do you mean? I mean, if you have type safety and things, it's definitely another layer of of, of prevention. You know, <laughs> like if you're cold, might as well wear a glove. I don't know. That metaphor made no sense. Whatever. There is uh, a new proposal that I found on the internet when I'm just on my computer saying... This is what we do in our spare time, by the way. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a little bit of a waste of effort, but I'm glad that you enjoy hearing about it, everybody. Uh, uh, there's a new Stage Zero proposal to add a pluggable type system to JavaScript. Stage Zero being that this is the straw man stage, which is uh, pretty much saying, could this be a thing? Like, this is effort putting forth to say, this could this be a thing? And what's interesting about this is that it's trying to... Kind of the, the goal of this is to make a pluggable type system such that uh, it'll add extensions to JavaScript but offload the type checking itself to external software. So that means that there'll be a standard way to actually annotate JavaScript with type information, but in terms of actually doing the type verification itself, that'll be done by TypeScript flow or closure. Yeah, I stage think, zero, go on. Oh, I was just going to say, like, this is this is really the first step to seeing a type JavaScript. They're basically saying, let's support what currently exists and let yeah. it run in the browser or in the engine, and then we'll figure out how the actual, like, type inference layer works, which I think is really, it's syntax before function, which you almost never hear. Yeah. It's like, normal, normally, like, it's like the pipeline operator, like, we know exactly what we want it to do, and now we're just going to argue for six months or six years about how it's going to work. <laughs> Whereas like with this one, it's like, let's just like use the syntax that exists and bring that in. <laughs> yeah, it's good. Yeah. Yeah. So one last notion note, this is a older article that I was referenced to me by Sarah Fetterman. And she actually gave me the reference for who sent it to her. But anyway, it is an article about salary negotiation. The title is salary negotiation, make more money, be more valued. And I thought this was so impressive. It, the kind of TLDR of this is you have already spent 30 minutes listening to us on a podcast. That's not true. We're at 24 minutes. But anyway, you have already spent more than 20 minutes listening to us on a podcast. Do you know how long a salary negotiation typically lasts? Five minutes. And that five-minute salary negotiation ends up impacting in your, your lifestyle for years to come. So it's a, it's a skill you should definitely learn. And on a related note, I am going to be giving a talk on the subject on December 18th at the React NYC meetup. So if you are in town, uh, I would in love New York to, City. In New York City, I would love to meet you in person. And you can listen to me ramble about how you ask people to give you more money. <laughs> and if you're not going to be in town, read this article because it does a better job of articulating it than I will anyway. I mean, as they say, more money, more problems. Yeah. And then... Boy.
And then finally, we have Harry's favorite section of the podcast. Matthew's jokes. Matthew's jokes. This is a time where Matthew tells jokes. Yeah, um, except I'm gonna I'm gonna let, twist it a little bit this week. I'm just gonna ramble. What? Yeah, I'm a I'm a cast a spell. I'm gonna I'm gonna ramble about one I of my favorite spell topics. On you. Harry Harry knows what one of my favorite topics is. It's I've already said half of it. Uh, I take umbrage at the Dumbledore. Yeah, yeah. It's Harry Potter. I love Harry Potter for some. For some more reference, I own approximately 90 Harry Potter books, which I keep in my Manhattan apartment, and I make it work because it's really important to me. Wait, I thought that was your bed. It's not my bed. No, uh, it's not. My bed's just like a behind. normal. Yeah, no, my bed's normal. Oh. <laughs> just your library. Is, There's just like is, a bookshelf filled Harry. with Harry Potter books and like a couple okay. of other things. So when you give a tour of the apartment, it's like, here's my bed, here's my computer, here's every Harry Potter book ever made. Yes, exactly. Good. <laughs> so anyway. Today I was having a discussion with some of my coworkers who did not know their Hogwarts houses, so I made them take the quiz. I was very disappointed to find out they were both Gryffindors, which is, of course, the worst house. Gryffindor, oh, it comes in last place. It is the house for people who peaked in high school. Then there is... Whoa, big words. Yeah, then there is Hufflepuff, who really have nothing else going for them other than they're better than Gryffindor. And there is a fantastic off-Broadway show called Puffs, which you should see. Second best is Ravenclaw. Those people are smart. And then the first best, obviously, are my ambitious brethren, the Slytherins, because I am all Slytherin all the time. So now I'm going to tell you some jokes, because I promised you some jokes. So Harry, on a scale of 1 to 10, how obsessed with Harry Potter are you? Uh, I'm going to say a solid 6.3, because my name's, first name is Harry, and my last name's not Potter. For me, it's about 9 and 3 quarters. Going with that one. <laughs> Why did Severus Snape stand in the middle of the road? Because the chicken was crossing the road. So nobody could tell which side he's on. Oh, that's you got to know the books to know that joke. Yeah. I guess you got to know the books for all these jokes. Yeah. So anyone who hasn't read okay. Harry Potter has no idea what you're talking about. Yeah. Well, you <laughs> you know why people can't tell my can't get my jokes. Why? Because there's something wrong with them. Something wrong with them. Is that, is that the third one? Yeah, that's the third one. Oh, thank God. All right, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in this week to episode number 58. I crack myself up. Yes, you do. And you crack me up <laughs> occasionally as well. Uh, crack up, crack on, crack off. That's the new version of the clapper. Uh, I think that was a thing that they used to say in the 60s. Tune uh, in, turn up, drop out, whatever it was. Yeah, that was the uh, 60s hippie movement. Yeah. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed us. Uh, I, I, I enjoyed this episode. This was a good episode. Yeah, last week was terrible. This one's great. I mean, it was just that uh, Thanksgiving hangover that hits you hard. Yeah. Now we're I'm in the uh, that December bitterness. Uh, this is always the part of the episode that I'm sure most people stop listening to, so I feel much more free. <laughs> just ramble but uh yeah god people thanks for uh tuning in to the episodes i got i got nothing else your beard's uh, looking pretty full right now harry my beard yeah your beard uh it's uh, is this a setup for a joke again no i just wanted to say something that our users have no, our listeners have no insight into <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, thank you, everyone, and we'll see you. Nope, we'll hear. Nope, you'll hear from us again next week while we slowly fall apart. <laughs> Goodbye.